All right, so it's my pleasure to have uh, Slobodan today. He will um, talk on behalf of Ambika a little bit as well, because yeah. <laughs> she can't be here. And maybe you can tell about the baby. Yeah, so she has got the baby, and so because of that, she will be absent for you. Yeah. OK. Shall we start? Yes, thank you. So this is a joint work between Ambika and myself, but uh, Ambika is doing most of work. I'm just supervising. But today I'm not going to talk much about uh, concrete results. I'm going to talk more about what is behind, the theory behind, and how these systems work. So that's why I, I put in the title bit parallelism and such. So this bit parallelism is a phenomenon that was that has been known for like uh, 25 years and well you will see so we are talking about search and search we need it every day in any occasion if we deal with digital computers there has been 70 years of research on search since the inception of digital computers people needed that and you always you are always short of resources when uh, when it comes to search so you can have efficient algorithms but still the amount of data that is to be uh, examined is too large this is a typical problem where we have discrepancy between theory and practice a mathematician would say this is an easy problem there is a solution. There is a there solution is a that is sublinear. So what can be what can be better? Nothing. Still, even with the fastest algorithm, we cannot do much if we are faced with exabytes of data. So there are other problems in this category that have polynomial algorithms, like um, finding uh, cryptography. That's a typical example. Finding um, an initial state of an equivalent linear feedback chip register that is capable of generating a sequence that is captured. So you can do it with quadratic complexity, but if uh, the length of this equivalent register is like 10 to the power of 50, then you cannot do it. That's the problem. So this is also a typical problem of this kind. So the input is too large. And in addition, when we talk about search, uh, the the growth of the input is much like exponentially and nobody can say exactly that it is exponential but we can say that it is like it behaves like exponential growth of data that we have to examine every day and you have been witnessing the uh, papers uh, saying that uh, we have produced more data in the last two years than in the last 50 years so 50 years before that, so uh, it grows very rapidly. So the question is, what can we do to get practical results from search? First, we can, and people are trying to do that, reduce the data set. So instead of searching for the exact string or object of whatever kind, we try to somehow uh, convert it to some shorter structure, like hashing, but then, if you hash, then we need special hashing in the sense that similarity is preserved. And that's difficult. This is not cryptographic hashing. So in cryptographic hashing, if you change one bit of input, half of the bits of the output will be changed. And there is no way of telling whether one hash image is uh, originating from another, uh, another object that is similar cannot do that. So we need similarity preserving hashes. So they, it's a problem by itself. Or we can do fingerprinting. So the difference is that thing in fingerprinting, the length of the output is not constant. So you have to convert your data into something shorter. But uh, here, the, the length of the output is not guaranteed to be like 128 bits or something like that. So we are not going to talk about each part reducing the data set. We are going to talk about inventing even faster algorithms. And for this, we are going to talk about this bit parallelism. 
And the fastest known search algorithms exploit this phenomenon called bit parallelism. What it is, we are going to explain today. In addition to bit parallelism, there are some algorithms that are fast on average. And why are they fast on average? Because sometimes they can skip some characters when they search for the pattern in the search string. So if um, such an algorithm uh, obtains a conclusion in between its, its work that uh, the search pattern cannot be in some portion of, of the search string, then it can skip it. So these skip algorithms are actually the fastest known. But they are fast on average. It's not guaranteed that they will always be as fast as those. Yes? Uh, one question, uh, maybe it doesn't matter, but when you're talking about a search problem, are you searching for the occurrence of an incident or all of the occurrences of a particular incident? Uh, it doesn't, doesn't not matter. It doesn't matter much. Uh, the, the question can be find all the occurrences. Okay. But Sometimes it's just one, okay. and sometimes there is no pattern in the search string at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, if we say one occurrence or many occurrences, these two problems are very similar and the techniques are the same. So once you find one occurrence, then you just continue doing the same to find another. So there is actually no difference in algorithm. So the fastest known algorithm is this PNDM family backward non-deterministic DAUG matching, where DAUG is a special kind of graph, uh, directed a cyclic word graph that can be assigned to any string. And in this in this case, uh, actually, since it is bit parallelism, we, we don't have time for this. It, it will be a whole lecture just about DAUGs. But this is a mathematical abstract structure that is actually equivalent to these bit parallelism structure. So uh, in bit parallelism algorithms, you actually do not construct these graphs. You don't need it. But it can be shown that operation of this algorithm is equivalent to having this. And why is it important? Because in that case, you have some guarantees about complexity. So the results that apply to DAUG algorithms apply to bit parallelism as well. So this one is actually the fastest one. And uh, it's a family because uh, they usually add a letter Q to that. Then you can read more than one character at a time and execute an algorithm on many characters at, at, at a time. Several, not many. And these are actually used in, in practice. For example, in intrusion detection systems like Suricata, they implemented that and claim that it is faster than it must be. Now, to explain bit parallelism, since we don't have much time, we, we start with a naive approach. So how would you do that if you wouldn't do any if you wouldn't know anything about search? So you take your search string, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. It's a typical testing string for teletypewriters from 100 years ago. So and we are trying to find fox in this sentence. So this is a search pattern. It's called it's called search pattern, what we are looking for. And the search string is in what we are looking for. Right? So you would do it like this. Put the search pattern in the beginning and compare with that part of the search string. Then move the pointer by one, start from the second one, then from the third one, until you find this one. In this case, you would have 17. Because Fox is at the 17th position. Now, this is naive because the complexity of this is the length of this search string times the length of the search pattern because every time we have to compare three characters in this case so that will be a lot so you can do it better so even the naive approach is not a big deal it's uh, mathematically it's not complicated it's quadratic if foxy if, if the um, pattern is long enough if the pattern is short like this then you can say it's linear because you have three Comparisons, that's almost nothing compared to the length of this. Not a big deal. But we can do it better. If we had infinite parallelism, so we can imagine that we have as many parallel machines as we like, then we would need n minus n plus one machines running in parallel to find the pattern in a single instruction, single step. So you can just put the as many machines as there are these characters minus the length of this plus one. So because the last one starts from this one, not from that one. 
Okay, that's why n minus n plus one. Okay, so you can have as many parallel machines as you like, and then you just execute one instruction on that computer, you get where your pattern is. Or if there are many patterns in this thing, you have every position where they are. Now, since we cannot have this, if we have a limited number of machines running in parallel, we do the same, but once we uh, use them all, we just shift and try from that position where we stopped. So we can do that. So bit parallelism is very similar to this. It's a simulation of a machine with infinite parallelism, but with limitation on how many parallel machines we can have. Now, these machines are such that they are not binary. So each of these machines um, is using characters of the alphabet, not binary zeros and ones. Because of that, on a digital computer, we can just simulate it, which is low, and there is no gain in doing this. What we would like is parallelism of binary machines. So just zeros and ones. And why is that? Because the operations of the algorithm for search would then include just operators that are present in the CPUs like shift and or, and that's very fast. It turns out that it is possible and it hasn't been discovered before like 25 years ago. So people needed that, but they didn't know how to do it. So the PhD thesis of Baezayates and Gonet Gaston, he's from Uruguay, I think. He was his supervisor. So the thesis was in 1989, and the, the paper was published in 1992. This shift and the first big parallel algorithm about which we are talking, we are going to talk. So if we suppose that the symbols of the search string arrive one at a time, and they are processed, and then we take the next thing. A new search machine is created for each symbol of the search string. So as if we had parallel structure. So we have a search machine for the first appearance of the first symbol. Then when the next symbol appears, we create another one, etc., etc. This is called non-deterministic finite automata, such a machine. This is a parallel machine. And it starts searching from the current input symbol. So if the symbol Q has arrived, so we create a machine starting searching from this letter and trying to match Fox in QUI in this case. So it will not match, but we shall explain. That. The explanation is the following. If the current input symbol cannot be matched by some machine, then we stop that machine and forget about it. We call that machine inactive. After processing each input symbol, some machines are active and some are not active. And actually, whether they are active or inactive is the only thing that matters. So we are only interested in whether these machines are active or inactive. And then we can encode that in, in bits because active is 1, inactive is 0, and that's it. So we have binary parallelism. These status bits, whether a machine is active or inactive, can be grouped, and we can group them in a computer word. And a computer word has like 32 bits or 64 bits, so we can run 64 bits in parallel, 64 machines in parallel. So if we have a pattern that is shorter than 64, then the number of operations in search is divided by 64. It's huge speed up. In addition, all the operations are binary bitwise operations, shifting by one, ending with a mask, or in with something that's very fast. Because we have instructions in the computer for that. Now, what differentiates bit parallelism from 
theoretical massive parallelism is that we cannot have as many machines as we like. We actually limit our jobs to n machines running in parallel, where n is the length of the pattern. That's what we are looking for. And the machine is assigned to the pattern. We don't care about the searching. Searching can be any. So if we are given the pattern, we assign everything to the pattern. That's for all search algorithms. We never, we never think about search string. Because search string can come whatever search string. So these M status bits are called status word. And we are going to demonstrate how this works. For example, if we have the search string UFO fox and the search pattern is fox, how does it work? We create a machine for the first symbol that arrives, U. It is expecting, the machine that is created is expecting an F, but a U arrives. So it will die, it will be proclaimed inactive. The status bit will be zero for that machine. So that's the only thing we care of. Once it is set to zero, it will never be one again. Now, an F comes. We create another machine, Fox, another machine that is expecting an F. Since an F has arrived, it will be active after receiving the <coughs> second character. Okay? Then an O arrives, and the first machine that was created was already dead. We don't care about that. But the second machine was active. And then O has arrived, so we check whether it is active, whether it is still active. It is because it was expecting an O, and an O has arrived. And in addition, we create another one, expecting an F. And this machine dies immediately because it was expecting an F, but an O has arrived. So after three processed characters, the status word is like this. The first machine that was created is inactive. The second machine that was created is still active. So the status bit is one because it has received F and O. It was expecting F and O. Okay. And the third machine that was created is not active because it was expecting an F and an O has arrived. So we have zero, one, zero. The question now is we don't have more bits because we have just the number of bits that is the length of the search pattern. So what happens when the next symbol arrives? Since we don't have more bits, we have to drop this one. This machine has to be dropped. So we shift, actually. We shift this one position to the left. Okay, so we have one, zero, zero. And then we create a new machine expecting an F, but before receiving any character, it will be active. It will be waiting for the first character until it arrives. So we actually OR with one. Okay. Now we check whether the character that arrived is the same as the character that is it, it is expecting. It is, so it will remain one. But we will, we currently don't care about this. So shifting is the first operation because we don't have to care about this machine any longer. We we don't have place in our computer world for that. So we shift, and then we create a new machine, and the newly created machine is always active before the character arrives. So it will be OR with one. Okay? And then we continue the process until we exhaust all the characters. So the next one that arrives will be O, and this will remain active because it is expecting O, etc., etc., until we find that all the that the third one is active. And then we say we have found the occurrence. That's called the occurrence when you find the pattern in the string. Yeah. Now, can we make automatic this phase? Do we know whether this newly created machine will remain active after the character arrives? Yes, we can. It turns out that it is always the case in our example, that an F will keep the first machine active if it was active before. O the second, and X the third. So we can do it, we can pre-compute that. 
and use it always. So that would be shift plus or for creation of the new machine and then end with what is called bit mask. And these bit masks are, for example, in, in this example, 001 for F, 010 for O, and 100 for X. So where the letter is in the pattern, but mirror, okay? So the bit mask for F will be 001, the bit mask for O will be 010, and the bit mask for F, <coughs> F X would be 100. So what, what would that mean? We would do shifting, or even with one, and then adding the bit mask that is assigned to the newly arrived character. So in this case, it would be 001. So we would have shift this, that's 100, or with one, that's 101, and then end with 001. Because F has arrived and its bit mask is 001. And that would remain 101 because ending with 001, sorry, it, it would be 001 because we end with 00, so just this machine would be active after processing this letter. And then we shift again, or with one, and end with the bit mask for O, and finally for X, and we shall find our search pattern. So as the result of this discussion, we get this status word updating formula, which is the new status word is the old one shifted by one or with one and ended with the bit mask of the incoming character. Just what I have said. And we do that for every J from the first one to N for every input character of the search string. So in our case, it'd be from one to six. So we would get a new status word for each number from J from one to six. And after updating the status word, we always check whether the bit DM is one, the most significant bit. If it is one, then we have found your case. So this is the algorithm that is called shift end. And why is that? It's obvious because we shift, then OR, and then END. It's very fast. It's exact search. And it's not the fastest on average because we never skip. Okay. But its complexity is low complexity is guaranteed. We can make it even faster, but that it doesn't have physical interpretation. If we complement the bit masks and the status bit, then we well, then we don't have to use OR. So we don't have to shift and OR and end. We can just shift and OR with the mask. And that's called shift OR algorithm. It's even faster. We save one operation. So that's bit parallelism, but it works for exact search. Now, if we want to allow up to K errors, either on the search pattern or on the search string, then we can, instead of using one status word, we can use K plus one status words. One word is for exact search, and then the rest K words for one error, two errors, etc., etc. And the operations can be match, that's horizontal transition, can be insertion of characters, that's vertical transition, can be substitution, Substitution is with a different character. So a match is a substitution with the same character. So it can be A with A. And if we substitute A for F or a B, then it's substitution. And this is this uh, solid diagonal transition. And the dash diagonal, if we don't consume character at all, that's deletion. So we can delete a character, we can insert a character, we can match a character or we can substitute. So usually, I know why Patrick is yeah. trying to concentrate. We got used to not uh, considering match and substitution different operations. So in search, it's usual thing because you treat match a different way than substitution. So match 
has some some um, weight because actually we are looking for a match and we have a loop in the fur in the position zero zero and why is that because we can start searching from any position in the search string if we are expecting for an f for example and the, the first several uh, letters several first letters of the search string are not an f then the machine will just wait in this state just expecting an f that's why we we have this loop in the in the in the position zero zero so we actually simulate a two-dimensional nfa where we have one dimensional array for exact search and the rest for one two three up to k errors so this is approximate search without constraints now what we are doing and that's actually the end of this talk is uh, because of the applications sometimes it's very useful to constrain for example how many operations of substitutions and deletion and insertion can be used to transform one string into another then we have constrained search so the same way as we have constrained edit distance if we want to uh, compute uh, if we are given two strings how different they are what number of these operations we have to do to, to perform in order to get one string from another yeah? but we don't want to use just any number of operations dis distributed anyhow we introduce some constraints for example we can say we cannot use more than one substitution and one deletion something like that and why is that because we need that in practice how if we are talking about malware detection or, we, or intrusion detection then what the attackers do is the following take an old attack change it a bit just a small bit and it will not be detected by any detection engine that uses exact search okay now if we instead of exact search use approximate search without constraints then it will allow any number and distribution of these operators but the attacker cannot do just any number of changes anyhow because if you change too much the the old attack string then it might not be harmful at all you have to choose it slightly instead of having for example a space in the search string they substitute it by percentage 20 or something like very very small change and they still make the attack undiscoverable by for example intrusion detection system or if it, if it is a file malware detection system if we are talking about spam filtering where we also have application of this thing if we want to spam somebody threaten somebody with the word threat okay and we as an attacker since spam filter will detect that and drop this mail we change too many letters then the spamming word becomes inintelligible the victim will not understand understand that it is a threat it must be like instead of threat with th threat without an h for example something that very small change so that's the idea that's why it is uh, if we use uh, if we use uh, unconstrained search and allow any number of uh, changes then we can have false positives because the the string would be accepted that the attacker will never quit it and to cope with this we use constraints we say we cannot allow more than one substitution or one deletion one substitution something like that small number of changes and then we introduce this constrained approximate search what's the idea how can we do it we don't allow just any transition in this nfa we introduce counters and assign them to the bits now of course we introduce some computation overhead to that but since we are talking about small changes these counters do not have to count too much it could be 
counting by zero one or zero one two at most. So it can be, it's it can still be fast. So that's what we are doing. So we we try to do that with uh, constraint on maximum number of allowed operations, like maximum number of substitutions, maximum number of deletions, insertions, something like that. And we manage to, by experimenting, we manage to reduce the false positive and false negative rates significantly compared to unconstrained approximate search. If we compare to exit search, that's of course the exit search will never discover such an attack. So that would be all. Okay, questions? Story? Yeah. Uh, is it possible, do you think of a possible way of uh, taking into account constraints that are not only numerical but they are also context dependent? Mm. So, in your example of threat, sure. can you take into account a <coughs> constraint that would say you can allow the H to be substituted by F but not by G? That's possible because. Okay. Um, we do that uh, in biology, for example, when they talk about uh, comparison of uh, amino acids yes. and DNAs. Mm -hmm. So in biology, uh, the weight of a substitution matters. Yes. So it's not the same. For example, um, adenine always goes with timine, not yes. with guanine. Yes. Yes not with cytosine. So we, we, we assign a weight of infinity to such. So you and can do that. Okay. That's yeah. possible. And then they have, in, in biology, they have a special matrices for distance, uh, for substitution distance. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in computer science, it usually doesn't matter. But in this case, it will be, and we are having an interesting master project with uh, Blackinger. Uh, there is a student uh, trying to incorporate this Substitution matrix okay. in the book. He's doing a master thesis, so okay. it's interesting. Patrick, the reason why the the the, the ones that create the malware mm -hmm. are making small changes be, is because the search algorithms nowadays are all exact search, right? So once they know that they are not looking for exact search, but they are looking up to three, four changes. They will make five changes. And as soon as you will look for five or six changes, they will make seven changes. So how do you how do you protect against that? I can I can very simply say I'll have some 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 uh, part of the code where the program hops over anyway and I can put whatever random I want and then and then if it's long enough, you will not detect you, you are right. If you are a human doing this, you can do it. They usually use tools. Written by I, others. Can I, for example, make a, a, um, make a burst of changes and uh, the, the beginning the uh -huh. and, and, and the postfix as constant? Could that be? That's detected? possible, but then we can introduce another kind of constraint that is constraint on uh, the length of the runs of deletions and insertions. We also have this as a project. Actually, we have obtained the, for, the updating formula for this case. Also, we have counters, but now we have a different kind of counters, not yeah. of single uh, operators, but uh, of the length, uh, counter of the length of the run of operations. Like we don't allow more than two consecutive deletions or two consecutive insertions. And when, if you are take, talking about tail and uh, prefix, then we can ignore that because of this, oh, sorry, because of this loop. So whatever uh, whatever number of changes you have before the first letter that is accepted arrives, it will just skip it. It is ignored. How about uh, you talk about insertion, deletion, and substitution? Uh -huh. about transposition. Uh, transposition. Transposition is deletion plus insertion, isn't it? Yeah, but that's so, two. Yeah. That's, that's two. <laughs> so. um, actually, you know this. It turns out that if you count transposition as a special operation, as, as a standalone operation, then an algorithm for computing edit distance becomes 
NP complete or something, the yeah. problem becomes NP complete, it's very difficult. So it's better not to do that. Oh, for uh, now I'm talking it, as an attacker. Yeah, <laughs> it costs it costs more than you doing deletion plus insertion. Yeah. That was this, I think, seller algorithm. Yeah, yeah that was too long. <laughs> Carl, uh -huh. I think uh, I've heard you speaking about FPGAs. Uh -huh. Does that mean that you can create a uh, string? word machines that have arbitrary string link that exactly match that's possible and that we are planning to do that okay and in addition to cope with the counters we would like to have more than binary logic so if you use ternary logic then you can have zero one two mm -hmm. so since we are talking about small changes that would be enough then we don't have counters at all mm -hmm. we have instead of zero one we have uh, a number characterizing the number of allowed operations from that state. Yeah. So that would be an idea. Yeah, that, that and was my question. With FPGA, what you can get, at least in theory, I have heard, never tried, but uh, we are going to do that. Uh, you don't have to have two, two levels. You can have like a hanging state or something like that. I think it is possible in practice to, to do that, ternary. And I have heard that uh, multi-level logic is produced somewhere. I tried to get that hugger, but never got a response. If you know anybody <laughs> producing that in the US, I would be grateful to know. I don't, but uh, maybe I can follow up. Yeah, if you, if you ever find some hardware that, it, that somebody produces and is willing to sell, that would be very nice. Yeah, my, my question was because you have to use counters and if you use zero one you don't really break the bit powers uh, algorithms but if you use one more then that you, have to, yeah, you, you have to deal with it separately so how much of a performance penalty you have to pay uh, because of we have uh, we have uh, done some experiments so uh, actually it depends on the the level of change so if you change more then it will spend more so uh, it goes up to twice as slow as unconstrained, but then uh, we always keep uh, false positive rate to zero. Mm -hmm. That's the great advantage. Any other questions? Ideas? Hmm? Of course, this is all in experimental phase, so we are testing, searching for new algorithms, and hopefully, Somebody would be interested to publish that. We, <laughs> we, we, we don't know. Would it be useful in your research? Because I, I think it, it has applicability, you know. Yeah, for example, you don't have to use text. You can use um, any alphabet that is uh, finite. It can, it can be sound. Mm. <laughs> huh? That's true, but the efficiency of this thing doesn't depend on the size of the alphabet at all. So, if you remember, what only matters is whether the machine is active or inactive. Eventually, some counter, but the counter of symbols with whatever alphabet will be the same. So it can be interesting to try. I think there are applications uh, using this for music. So if you want to recognize what song is this is. Yeah. So they have a database of patterns. Yeah. Now, my son uses that on a daily basis, so I know <laughs> that it exists. <laughs> are the feature vectors frequency domain or do they some kind of I really don't know. But I can imagine that it must use some search algorithm, maybe not this one, but uh, I think this uh, shift and shift or they are used everywhere. Because of the efficiency. Yeah, because of the efficiency. And these skip algorithms, for example, they are fast. They can be used everywhere except in intrusion detection. Why is that? Because in that case, you can use what is called algorithmic attack. <laughs> so you deliberately launch a string that is difficult to, to treat by a skip algorithm and make it slow. 
So they are not good. That's why most uh, commercial and uh, open source still use Zaho Korasik that is like 50 years old. Mm -hmm. 40 years, 1975. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Slavo. <laughs> It never happened. Okay to have a meeting in your office. Can we grab some food?